And in particular, when you have to type in your type in your PIN, your personal identification number to such a teller machine, how do you know that the teller machine is not going to memorize it and not interact with your bank at all, but just store your PIN and then use it later with a fake of your card and just withdraw money from your account and so on? You never know that. So as a matter of fact, it's it's a very um, unsafe mechanism that we are used to. To, um, just to give a quick introduction, Professor Cripo is a uh, is a professor at the University at McGill University uh, in the Department of Computer Science, specializing in cryptography, and uh, he is very well known for uh, being one of the co-inventors of quantum teleportation and uh, and being part of uh, very important progress in the area of zero knowledge proofs. So uh, we recently, uh, one of his works came to our attention, which was published in, in Nature. So very, very uh, prestigious uh, journal. Um, and I, I believe it's uh, demonstrating uh, an, an, a real life application of some cryptography uh, that was developed uh, by, by uh, Professor Kripo and, and, and coworkers. Uh, so it's really connecting the real world to the theory. And we're very excited to learn more about this. So with that, uh, thank you for having a presentation uh, ready for us, and we're, we're looking forward to discussing. So thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so exactly what I'm going to talk about is the experimental demonstration of a relativistic zero-knowledge proof, um, which is going to be um, I'm going to be covering some computer science aspects and a little bit of physics aspects um, to demonstrate um, how this works. So this is joint work with my colleagues, Puria, Nicolas, Sebastien, Raphael, Wixu, Nan, and Hugo. Um, those two in pinkish colors are my local Montreal co-authors. Puria is from McGill and Nan was from Concordia. And the rest of my co-authors are from uh, physics in, the, in uh, Geneva. So I'm going to introduce you to um, a real life problem, which is how can you tell if you go to a teller machine where you want to withdraw money, if you're interacting with a real one or a fake one? And in particular, when you have to type in your, type in your PIN, your personal identification number to such a teller machine, how do you know that the teller machine is not going to memorize it and not interact with your bank at all, but just store your PIN and then use it later with a fake of your card and just withdraw money from your account and so on? You never know that. So as a matter of fact, it's, it's a very um, unsafe mechanism that we are used to. Um, because we have to give away our very um, secret information, the PIN code, um, and whoever is receiving it could store it and use it later on. So I'm going to teach you first a little bit about um, the crypto aspect. Um, and the crypto aspect will involve three participants, the prover, the verifier, and so the role of the prover is to convince the verifier of the validity of a certain mathematical statement. In particular, we're going to be dealing with um, the colorability of graphs. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. And the third character is called adjudicator and is, sorry, is interacting with the verifier And you can think that um, the prover is you at the teller machine, that the verifier is a fake ATM, which receives your password. And the adjudicator is another ATM where this fake would like to use um, the, the information collected from the verification process. So the goal is to be able to get um, 
the prover to convince the verifier, but that the verifier, given what he receives from the prover, is unable to convince the adjudicator of the same thing. And this may sound impossible at first, but I'll demonstrate how this can be done. So this basic concept known as zero knowledge proofs was invented in the mid 1980s by Shafi Goldwasser, Sylvio Michali, and um, Charles Rakoff. And um, they define what we call interactive proofs. An interactive proof is a mechanism by which a prover on the left can demonstrate that a string W belongs to a certain language L. And in so doing, the verifier will ask questions like A, the prover will answer another question, another answer, and they can exchange about W like that a little while. And after this, um, If we're able to do that for a particular language, um, L, we're going to say that L is um, is a member of IP IP standing for interactive proofs. So, can I ask a question? Sorry. Sure. So, here, when you say language, do you just mean uh, a set that has a certain property? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. Cool. It's a computer okay. science, it's a theoretical computer science way of saying a set of a set of strings. With a certain property, I guess. Yeah, with a certain property. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So to so to have a so-called interactive proof, we need two properties. One is called completeness, and completeness is that we want that there exists a verifier and there exists a prover such that whenever W is in L, whenever W is part of the language, we wish that a conversation between the prover and the verifier leads the verifier to accepting with probably nearly one. So this is completeness. Whenever W is in L, we want the verifier to accept. Many of the, many of the, um, proofs we're going to describe will have an acceptance probability of exactly one. So in that case, we say it's perfect completeness. On the other hand, um, when the string is not in the language, when W is not in L, we request that for the same verifier, but for any prover whatsoever, when W is not in L, we wish that the acceptance probability of the verifier on this W be very low. So we call it, we, we quantify it with some small epsilon here. And um, for every epsilon, we want asymptotically that this happens. When the strings W get greater, we wish that this epsilon gets smaller and smaller. Um, so this gives us a clear separation between those strings that are in the language from those strings that are not in the language. And I guess there's probably something that's going to come in with like the number of interact, the, the length of the interaction that's permitted uh, within these proofs. Like that's those, right. So we're, um, we're looking at the computational model, which um, corresponds to polynomial time participants. So we're, we're making the prover and the verifier be, um, when possible, I, I'll, I'll say more later about this. When possible, we're going to make them both um, polynomial time because we want them to be efficient enough that we can implement them. Um, and in particular, in the protocol that I'm going to describe today, both the provers and the verifiers will be um, polynomial time. But we want that even for arbitrarily powerful provers, they shouldn't be able to demonstrate false statements. 
they shouldn't be able to demonstrate that W is, is an L when indeed it is not. So this is soundness. Now, soundness is a property where we're trying to protect the verifier from dishonest proof from the dishonest prover. We're trying to make sure that the prover is not able to prove something false to the verifier. Now, the other property that we're going to discuss is called zero knowledge. And the property of zero knowledge, on the contrary, is protecting the prover from the verifier. And zero knowledge essentially is going to mean that whatever the verifier is going to see is things that he could have predicted by himself in the first place. He will only see answers that he already knew. Or at least he would have been able to create the same questions and answers with the same distribution as in a real conversation without actually knowing a proof that W is an L or not. So I'll make that a little bit more precise in a few slides. Now, the rest of this talk is going to be about specifically the problem of tree colorability. In this problem, we have a, a map, in this case, a map made of birds. Um, and the, 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 the language is going to be all such maps that are tree colorable where tree colorable means that using tree colors, assign, one of which is assigned to each region, um, it should never happen that two regions neighbors to each other end up of the same color. So if it's possible to achieve that, we say that the map is tree colorable. And if it's not possible for every coloring, there's always two neighbors that are of the same color, then we say it's not tree colorable. Now, why choose this particular problem? Because this, pr this problem is NP-complete. And so that means that any problem in NP um, traveler salesman problem is hard and you want to base your security on this traveler, traveling salesman problem, you can turn your traveling salesman problem into a tree colorable graph. Of course, the graph is going to be bigger, but it's going to be in, in some polynomial relation. The, the amount of the transformation is, is a polynomial time reduction. And so it's not going to get tremendously bigger than the original um, traveling salesman problem. Okay, so if, if you don't really know much about NP completeness, you can just ignore what I just said, but um, we're gonna focus on the tree colorability problem. Now, of course, the map I'm showing you here has only five birds in it, and that's gonna be way in this case to figure out that it is. Now, in general, we work with much larger um, examples such as this one, and it gets a lot harder on such a large, ex a large example to figure out whether it's tree colorable or not. Um, typically, we use the graph with a few, um, a map with a few thousand regions, with a, sorry, a few hundred regions and a, a, uh, 1,000 connecting regions to each other. But for sake of simplicity, I'm going to stick to this small map throughout the presentation. So of course, if all you care about is completeness and soundness, then the prover can just communicate it's tree coloring to the verifier, and the verifier can efficiently check that this is indeed a tree coloring. For every region, you check the neighboring regions and you see that they're of distinct colors. And you do that for each region. And after doing it for every one, which will take you some quadratic time or something like that, um, you will find that all neighboring regions are of different colors. And so this is 
a valid tree coloring and this proves that this map is tree colorable. Um, however, this definitely doesn't satisfy the zero knowledge property because this map, this map coloring is definitely transferable. After seeing your coloring of the map, seeing the prover's coloring of the map, the verifier can go to the adjudicator and say, look, I know the tree coloring of this map and show that to the adjudicator and the adjudicator get convinced as well. So this method is completely transferable and that's definitely not what we're after. We're after something much more subtle that will allow the prover to convince the verifier, but not the verifier to convince the adjudicator. So in the real ATM example, we have soundness and completeness, I guess, but not zero knowledge. Well, in the implementation that we have, we're going to get all of completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge, so, but through so, a but, different method. But for real ATMs right now in the real world. OK, uh, for real example right now, um, when you give away your pin, you're essentially giving away the equivalent of the coloring. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, okay. So it's exactly what you just uh, described, where you have soundness and completeness, but no zero knowledge because that. But no zero knowledge, knowledge at all. Exactly. Perfect. Very is good. there a, a, a like a difference though with the pin, where like the pin is just some some form of knowledge that you decided on? It's not some computational problem that you have to arrive at. Like, um, yeah, well, I'm just trying pin, to see the analogy the, between. The pin is the answer to a computational problem in the sense that. Um, you can test if the pin is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, oh, like okay, I'm not going to go into the details of how cards work nowadays, but your card knows your pin. Yeah. And basically when you tell the teller machine your pin, the teller machine tells your card what the pin is and ask the card, is this a valid, is this a valid pin to you? Mm -hmm. And then the card answers. Now we're pushing the belief elsewhere. We're pushing the belief. Well, still, if if you can make a copy of my card, you, you, you'd have, if, if someone steals my card, for instance, then they can go use my pin and use my card to withdraw money and so on. Even in this new setup, which is like 15 year old, 20 year old. Um, Okay, that makes sense. So let me now move on and tell you about the solution found by Goldreich, Michali, and Vigderson. Um, they found a mechanism by which the prover can convince the verifier, but without giving away the coloring itself. So to do that, the commitments are just commitments in general. A commitment is a mechanism by which you can give away the computational equivalence of a safe, which is some box in which you can encapsulate a value, but that hides the value. And you can give that to the other party, to the verifier, and the verifier will know that there's something inside the box, but will not know what the value is. And potentially at a later time, the prover will give away the combi combination to the safe, and then the verifier can open the safe and see the color inside. Now, in the example that we'll see, um, not all safes are going to be opened. Most of the safes will remain closed forever, whereas a few of the safes will be open and the color will be verified. So this, this time separation between commit and unveil and basing on a decision of the verifier which safe to be opened is what will convince the verifier that indeed the graph, the, the map is tree colorable. Um, so if you commit to every color of every node, so the prover has a certain coloring in mind, and then 
puts the colors into safes and assigns one safe to each region. And then the verifier will choose two neighboring regions that it's choosing. So we can say, oh, I want to check the two three relation between these two, um, these two birds here, bird number two and bird number three. And he wants to check that these two birds are of different colors. So the verif sorry, the prover can then give away the commit. And then the verifier will open the safe, see their colors, and observe that, yes, indeed, these two birds are of different colors. Now, however, if we just repeat like that, that return everything into safes, and then allow the verifier to request some other pair to check, then eventually the verifier is going to learn all the colors and we're back in a transferable situation. So we need a little twist on what I said. So instead of just repeatedly using the same coloring and sending commitments to the colors, we're going to reassign the colors in the coloring before we recommit and do it again. So in the initial situation, this was the coloring. And after looking at the two, three relation, the two, three um, regions, um, you know that they are of different colors and they were in that particular case, blue and yellow. Now, before we do it again, the prover is going to choose a renaming of the three colors. So if the three colors were blue, yellow, and red, then he randomly selects one of six possibilities and decides to rename blue, yellow, rename yellow, red, and rename red, blue, so that an alternate coloring can be used. Um, sorry, let me go back to this slide. This, this is not the initial coloring. Let me just compare. In the initial coloring, we had red, blue, and yellow in this order. And in this new order, I have blue, yellow, and red. So the order of the colors has been reassigned. So why, why reorder the colors? Because if I do that, the next time you ask for two neighboring regions and check their colors, the colors are going to be unrelated to the first time. They're just going to be two random colors that are distinct. And that's all you're seeing each time. Each time, the only thing you're seeing is two neighboring colors that are distinct. But what are they exactly? depends on the particular recoloring that's chosen by the verifier, sorry, by the prover. So the prover relabels the colors and reassign all the colors of all the regions. And if you ask the same question again, two, three, you will see blue, yellow, whereas the first time they were red and blue. Now the advantage is, that you're not learning anything special about this tree coloring that the prover has in mind. Because each time the only thing you see are two neighbors with different colors and the two colors are just random. They're just randomly two of the three colors that are available. And they're unrelated to the actual coloring that the, the prover is using in the sense that each time you see it, they're independent of each other. So you can do it once again, if you reassign them, you reassign the colors once more, and then you request for the zero three um, pair, you will see that those two are blue and red, but if you were to request it again, you would see them in red and blue, and you will see them in red and yellow, and all possible pairs will show up in each 
pair of neighbors. What would be the, the so, relationship? Sorry, but quickly, what would be the relationship between the number of colors uh, or, yeah, number of colors you would need to use, uh, like the, the possible reassignments or remappings of your of your color so that the 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 verifier can't glean anything well the thing is each time each time you use it you don't give away any information at all okay. you're not helping at all yeah and you're picking one of six reordering because there are only three colors. So there yeah. are three factorial ways to reorder, reorder them. And that gives you six possibilities. Um, so you're not giving away any, any knowledge. You're not giving away any information. Mm -hmm. The word knowledge is an equivalent of information, but encapsulating the fact that it's computational information that you're not giving away. Um, so this, this coloring with multiple colors is to represent the fact that what the verifier observes is actually just a bunch of random colors. The only thing that matters is that any two neighbors are of different colors, but that's the only thing he learns. Mm -hmm. He only learns that the neighbors um, are always of different colors, but he doesn't learn what particular coloring the prover cares about. So in this case, if the verifier records the whole conversation with the prover and goes back later to adjudicator and say, look, I know the three coloring, I know a, a three coloring of this graph, of this map, then the adjudicator will say, no, this is not a three coloring at all. Um, and because I didn't choose those questions, I cannot trust that you chose them properly and they can be, um, you could have made up this thing completely by yourself. And even if the verifier is doing his best to convey something useful from the prover to the adjudicator, he's not able to at all. Now, let me be a little bit more technical for a second. So the non-transferability non is not zero knowledge, but is a part of zero knowledge. If you're zero knowledge, you're definitely not transferable. Zero knowledge is even stronger than not transferable. It's, a, um, it's somewhat a Turing test version um, defining what zero knowledge, zero knowledge is. So in zero knowledge, we have that the the, the verifier should, should not be able to convince the adjudicator that he actually interacted with the prover. Whatever he's going to come up with talking to the prover, he could have come up with it by himself. So typically, in, um, in an interactive proof where the adjudicator is involved, the adjudicator is allowed to provide the verifier with instructions as how to choose his questions, use certain prescribed randomness when he chooses randomly, all sorts of things like that. So this is called the auxiliary input. The adjudicator can give instructions to the verifier to an auxiliary input. Then the verifier interacts with the prover to get convinced of a particular statement, like W is an L. And at the end, the verifier is going to flip back and tell the adjudicator what he saw. So he's going to record the whole interaction with the prover and then tell the adjudicator, look, this is what I saw. And the adjudicator will look, will look at the instructions he provided to the verifier, will look at the con to someone who knew a proof that W is an L, or did he make this up? And so we're going to say that um, it's zero knowledge. If there exists a simulator that only interacts with the verifier, that's able to reconstruct exactly the same conversations without actually talking with the prover. So it, 
the simulator is not at all talking with the prover. Now, how come the simulator can do that without talking to, to the prover and the verifier cannot? Well, the difference, if you allow me to go back here, is that the verifier, when he interacts with the prover, he asks a question, get an answer, ask a question, get an answer. Whereas the together, he's not asking anyone, he's just simulating. And so he can create an answer and create the corresponding question from the answer, if he likes. Um, that's one trick he can use. Or he can create the question and the answer together. He doesn't have to give away the question and get the answer back. And it's this difference that makes it possible for the simulator to create a simulated conversation, whereas the verifier is really having a conversation. That's convincing because he's speaking with the prover. So, so in this auxiliary input example, the adjudicator gives all the questions to the verifier? Well, that's one possibility. Or he can also, um, he could give the questions, but he could also give instructions as how to create the questions and things like that. But even if he gives the questions, um, the simulator is going to be able to simulate um, the conversation because he's given all the questions ahead of time. In so, the so, real yeah. interaction, the questions can be selected from the answers. So if I give you a first question, I can get an answer back and I can choose my second question as a function of the first answer and so on. Right. But so the judicator so cannot do that because it doesn't see the answers. Right, so he gives all the questions ahead of time and then expects all the responses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So this is the formal definition. This is the judge in the middle trying to make up his mind, is this a real verifier talking with the prover, or is this a simulator simulating those conversations? And if it's perfectly impossible for the judge to tell the two situations apart from each other, then we say that this is perfect zero knowledge. Hence the Turing test. Yeah, this is like a Turing test. If it's completely impossible for the judge to tell these two things apart, um, then um, we're in a situation where the protocol, the interaction between the prover and the verifier is indeed zero knowledge. All right, so I hope you got some intuitive notion of what zero knowledge is, and I'm not gonna go into these technical details any further. I'm just gonna jump back out tell you a little bit about the rest of the framework and then present my protocol. Now, the question is, how do we implement these commitments that I'm taking for granted? How can we do that? How can we build some computational tool that will act like a safe so that I can put a value in some other value that doesn't reveal what I put in and such that I can later give you a combination to open it or something like that. Well, that's a non-trivial task. But Goldratch Mikhaili Vigderson used a notion which was already around at that time, which is to do commitments using one-way functions. Um, a one-way function is a function which is easy to compute in one direction, in the forward direction, but hard to invert. So if I give you x, computing f of x is easy. If I give you y and I ask you, give me an x such that f of x is y, that's hard. And so based on the existence of one-way functions, you can show that commitments can be constructed in such a way that even an all-powerful prover talking to a little limited polynomial time prover um, cannot break what we call binding, 
binding is a property that you cannot decide at the later moment what's inside the box. Once you've given the box to the other party, you cannot later decide what's in the box. You must have been committed to the content of the box from the beginning. So based on, these, on the assumption that one way function exists, we can build commitments um, such that a polynomial time verifier cannot tell what's inside the box. It's not impossible to tell what's inside the box, but as far as we can tell, it takes exponential time or more to figure out what's inside the box. And this corresponds a little bit with the real model of a, of a safe, because in a safe, you just have to enumerate all possible combinations and eventually you will open the safe. So a safe is really a computational problem because you just need to enumerate an exponential number of combinations and you will eventually find the opening of the safe. So these are now, three colors. Sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Isn't three coloring also uh, you know, a safe in some sense where you can just enumerate all possible colorings and find it? You're right. However, when you assume things like one way functions, not only will you assume that the tree coloring problem you start with is, is hard, or is that particular instance is going to be such that whoever tries to find a tree coloring will take a lot of time, but you're assuming something else, which is completely unrelated to the tree coloring. You're assuming that some, something completely independent of tree coloring is also hard. And that's the part that we managed to get rid of. We're not going to get rid of the tree coloring, but we're going to get rid of the extra assumption that some cryptographic function or some um, RSA is hard or that AES is hard or some, um, some specific things. And you typically will need many instances of this extra assumption. Now, in the protocol that we have, there will be no other assumption than the, the tree colorability of the graph that I'm using is going to be difficult to figure out. But is that separate? That, I guess it's separate from a, a function that's one way. It, so in other words, if... if it's, an, it's uh, similar, but it's separate in the sense that you're making a single assumption about a single statement, whereas when you make an assumption about the one-wayness of the function, you're going to use the same function with many input outputs, and you need them all to be hard. I see. You oh, see? Okay. So, so it's not a general state. Okay. Yeah. So, so you need a very specific statement to be true versus a very general. That's statement. right. I'm not going to make a general statement that all graphs are hard to three color, right? right. I'm just going to say, I trust enough that this graph is hard to three color. I'm going to live with the unsatisfactory fact that um, someone may eventually find it. And if I feel uncomfortable after a month or two that my graph is, my, my map is known, and that someone may eventually find the recoloring of it, then I'll just change it to another one that I, a fresh one that I can trust better. And I have a complete control over that. Okay, I see. Whereas in the other framework, like this one, um, you can um, you can break the assumption, the, the one wayness assumption, and eventually um, break the system completely. Each time, each time you use it, you can tell exactly what's going on, and you can break the zero knowledge aspect all the time. And, and get away with it and not have the other person um, be able to tell that you're breaking the assumption all the time. All right. Um, now the bottom line is that if you want unconditional commitments that do not reveal at all what's inside the safe and such that you cannot at all change your mind about the content of the safe, then that's unfortunately impossible. But that's exactly what we do. 
So on one hand, I tell you it's impossible. And on the other hand, I tell you this is what we do. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is a setup that was invented a little bit after the invention of zero knowledge. It's the setup of multi-prover interactive proofs. Sorry, uh, just uh, before we move on, I had a like j an attempt to make the commitment idea more concrete. Would an implementation of that look like hashing some value and then unveiling the pre-image later and showing that the hash matches, something like that? Yes, I could give you, I could give you the hash of a, of a string and some predicate about my string is going to be the hidden bit. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, I, I pick a random string and if my random string has a majority of zeros over a majority of one in the string, then it represents a zero. And if it has a majority of one, then it represents a one. And then I give you the hash of my string as the commitment. And later on, I can provide you with the string and you can rehash it and check that it really hashes to what I gave you before. And then you can validate if there was a majority of zeros or a majority of ones in the string that I knew. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. So the idea that we're gonna exploit is called multi-prover interactive proofs. It's a scenario invented by Ben Orgel, Vassar, Killian, and Vigderson, um, where they introduced the idea that instead of having a single prover, we're gonna have two provers. So what is the advantage of having two provers? Well, if you're able somehow to split them so that they cannot talk to each other, we're gonna end up in a situation similar to a police interrogation. You can, you can distinguish truth from falsehood much better if you can interrogate people in separate rooms than if you interrogate them together. Because when you interrogate them separately, they cannot talk to each other or listen to their answers and so to respond to the same question. So there's an added power at distinguishing truth from falsehood when you separate the provers. So the purpose of the provers is gonna be the same as before, but they can pre-agree on some random strings that they're gonna use in the proof, and they can pre-agree on the strategy how they're going to do this, how they're going to convince the verifier that W is an L. Um, and the verifier will interact with the two provers um, in a way to figure out whether W is an L or not. Now, when that we're able to do that for some language L, then we say that L is in MIP for multi-prover interactive proof. Um, which is a generalization of interactive proofs with a single prover. So in terms of um, completeness, just like before, we still have that whenever W is in L, we wish that the verifier is very likely to accept when the string is in L. So upon having a conversation with the provers, the verifier the police officer will be convinced that W is an L. And for um, soundness, we want that um, the provers interacting with the verifier, regardless of the strategy that they agreed upon, and regardless of the amount of data they exchange in the first place, they should not be able to get the verifier verifier to accept, except with a very small probability. So when W is not in L, the verifier should have a very small acceptance probability. But of course, this is under the assumption that the two provers cannot talk to each other. Now, what did they mean when they said that the provers shouldn't talk 
shouldn't be able to talk to each other. Now, one way that you can imagine this is by designing some Faraday cages that are very, um, very good at stopping all form of communication from one place to another. So if you put both provers in a Faraday cage, they cannot communicate via sound, they cannot communicate via radio waves, because this is precisely where the Faraday cage is stopping. Um, we don't really know of much way to communicate um, from inside Faraday cages. Unfortunately, this is very impractical because Faraday cages are really hard to build and they're very expensive. And it's not a theoretical proof that you cannot communicate. It's a practical proof, but it's not a theoretical proof. And in particular, now that we know that gravitational, gravitational waves can propagate through basically anything, um, they could use gravitational waves to communicate. Now, of course, this is a technical, technological challenge to do, but there's nothing theoretically that prevent people from communicating from each other um, if you only put walls to try to separate them. So one of the authors also suggested, Killian, suggested that instead maybe what we should do is that we should have the provers be far enough from each other that within a short amount of time, they cannot talk to each other at all. And we'll, we'll have to rely on their own devices. They will have to rely on the information they exchange with the other party, and they cannot talk to each other to figure out what question the other got and what answer you gave and stuff like that. So, this was the birth of what we call relativistic multi-prover interactive proof. It's relativistic in the sense that it uses special relativity's assumption that nothing can, no information can travel faster than the speed of light. And so um, under this assumption, we're gonna be doing some interactive proofs with two provers. And in order to get fast questions and fast answers, we're also gonna split the verifier as two verifiers. And the two verifiers are gonna be located very close to the two provers. So we're gonna have a prover verifier pair in one location and a prover verifier pair in a second location. And the verifiers will synchronize to ask the questions to the provers and get their answers in such a short time that it's not possible to propagate from one spot to the other what the question and the answer at the other end were in the same time frame. Does that make sense? And yeah. uh, so, but, uh, so I have a quick question. When you say synchronize the verifiers, well, the, uh, the verifiers will be allowed to, to communicate um, and they uh, will have some mechanism to trigger the questions at essentially the same moment. So the browsers uh, have to be like physically separated. They're, they're, but they will be physically rules, separated by distance. Okay. I'll show you our experimental setup around the end of the talk. And the prover verifiers were 60 meters apart from each other. But I guess my question is, are we assuming that, for example, the prover, prover one can't intercept the communication from verifier two to verifier one? No, we're not assuming that. We're just assuming that if he, 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 when he intercepts it, it will be too late for him to use it. Even though it's even though it's not too late for verifier one to use it, you see the time it takes for the conversation between prover two and verifier two, yep. to reach P one. P one must have answered his own question before that. Okay. So you can't you can't wait on what happens at the other end to answer your question. Because if you do that, you're going to answer your question too late. 
Okay, so it's set up in such a way that even if I intercept the question from the other uh, verifier, um, I, I can no I longer can't... use it because I've already answered to my question. Even though the verifier one has explained to verifier two what his question will be. Yes, because it's not it's not the pro it's not the problem of not knowing the question, but not knowing the answer to the question. I mean the verifier, the verifiers can pre-agree on the questions, and indeed they mm -hmm. will. So they will completely okay, okay. pre-agree on the questions. I so see. they perfectly okay. know what question the other verifier is going to ask, but he doesn't know the answer of this question. Uh, uh, okay, that's fine. But my question was, I guess, okay, so they, they, they pre-agree and then meet with the provers. That's right. They pre-agree on okay. the questions. They're not necessarily using the same question, but they perfectly know how they're going to question their okay, provers. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Now, however, um, what is reasonable in a relativistic setting? How can I describe the possibilities for the provers? How powerful are the provers in this relativistic setting? And that's a question which in the 19, 1960s um, questioned tremendously John Bell. John Bell um, started from the work of Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen in the 1930s. And he started looking at so-called hidden variable models of reality. Is it the case that reality can be represented by, if you separate parties far enough from each other, what are they limited to? What is it that they can do and that they cannot do? And in particular, what John Bell established is that somehow quantum mechanics seems to allow something which is more powerful than what we classically thought it would allow them. So let me try to convey a little bit more of this, uh, this idea. What seems a natural model for what one can do when separated is what we call locality. Locality is the set of answers you can give to questions if you are limited to using your own information to answer. So if um, if you if so this box here is qualified of being local if given this A, it computes an answer to some F of A of some sort and output that as X. And similarly, at the other end, given B, you compute G of B and you get Y. But each end doesn't use the question from the other end. You don't learn the other question and you don't learn the other answer. So this is called what we call local deterministic. Local deterministic means that both parts are separate from each other. That's why they're called local. And they're deterministic if this is a deterministic function inside the red box. So, now, so however, good. what we call local is the same, but such that the two parts can pre-agree on stuff like coin tosses and like a strategy. They pre-agree that on certain, on certain questions, you're going to produce a certain answer. You can pre-agree on how you're going to behave, but you're never allowed to use the input from the other side. You're only allowed to use the input from your own side and the stuff that was pre-agreed upon. So sorry, if I can just back, uh, I, I, I guess I'm confused now this box here is, uh, imagine I, I, I have a, someone that asked me a question, uh, give me F of A and, F of, and G of B, uh, but only uh, one person gets A and one person gets B. 
That's right. And what are the conditions, or what 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 uh, you're trying to, you're trying to describe the properties that uh, each person or the the combo of these two people can have? And the uh, yeah, I'm trying to describe what these two provers can do. Okay. When they are forced to being separated, and okay, I'm describing perfect. the box as the resource they have access to in this restricted um, environment. So, yeah, so, okay, so depending on what kind of separation, uh, what can they do, basically? That's right. Like okay, now it would be Thank gravitational you. waves or something. That would be the best they could use. Well, gravitational waves will also signal at the speed of light. So it's not going to help them in, in, in this regard. Because in, in the case where you create distance between the provers, where you enforce distance between the provers, you, you make sure that whatever means of communication they use will be too slow for them to take advantage of it. So actually on that- Even gravitational waves. You mentioned that there's the assumption that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. My physics is very rusty. So I just want to check that that is indeed an assumption. So there's no formal proof of that? Absolutely. We can be wrong I mean, about that. Yes. Okay. And however, if someone demonstrated that the speed of light can be fast, can be uh, that larger, that faster than light communication is possible, that would have a lot more implications than a particular one-way function being invertible. The ATMs. It's a much more fundamental, believable assumption of the world. Um, I'm not saying it's an absolute because we never know for sure because we make all our decisions based on experiments, right? All right, let me go on. Now, locality is one level of correlation that the provers may have. Another level is what they could achieve from quantum stuff, from quantum mechanics. If they're allowed to share a quantum state and apply um, arbitrary quantum measurements to this quantum state, well, that would be a larger set of possibilities. And that's really what Bell was, uh, was after. Bell wanted to convince the world that there are certain types of correlations that are stronger if you allow quantum mechanics than if you model reality according to this local framework. So Bell essentially demonstrated that we must be able to make an experiment with quantum mechanics that demonstrates that it's more powerful than locality according to this um, classical definition. And indeed, this was demonstrated experimentally. So experimentally, we, we believe, because we've seen it in the lab, we believe that people can achieve correlations that are stronger than um, simply uh, the correlations of locality. Now, these two layers are layers among something bigger that I'm going to call the non-locality hierarchy. And I'm going to describe that to give you a perspective of what's possible and what is not possible. Sorry. Carlos, just, you uh, had a question. Yeah. Um, this is physics. I, I really know very little here. But the when you mentioned that using quantum uh, effects, that there would be some correlations it can achieve, is that somehow related to their degree of separation in space? Or is it independent of that? Like if they're far enough apart, you no longer have this correlation? No, it's, it's, it's related because quantum correlations will work independently of the distance. Okay. So you could be at millions of astronomical units away distance 
and still the quantum correlations would behave right on the spot. Okay. Because they don't allow you to communicate. And that's an important point. They don't contradict special relativity. They complement special relativity. They allow you more powerful correlations, but they don't contradict relativity. Thank you. Now, in this hierarchy, I'm going to consider that I have two local parties and that they have access to a, an extra feature that I'm going to call a correlator. That's not a real word, but I'm making it up. So I have a correlator, which is going to be allowing them to gain extra power, um, but they're otherwise local. So for example, let me show you. I'm going to define the set of local hidden variable models to be everything that can be achieved from the identity correlator. The identity correlator is absolutely trivial. You have your input A here and gives you back A, and you have your input B here that gives you B back. And so if you have this correlator and you're local, what you can do is the set of local hidden variable correlations. And these correlations have the feature that they don't allow you to communicate. You cannot use this correlator, this identity correlator, you cannot use it to signal from one party to the other because it's just giving you back your input. And so clearly B does not depend on A and A does not depend on B here. It's not a function of A and B that you get, you just get B itself and you just get A itself. Now the complete opposite of that is the so-called signaling correlation. The signaling correlation, you have input A here on the left and you have output A on the right. And you have input B on the right and output B on the left. Now, this is the super duper correlation that allows you to communicate. If I give you access to this box, then you can talk to each other as much as you like. So this is sort of the opposite completely of the signaling of the local hidden variable model. The local hidden variable model is a very small subpart of the signaling um, level of the hierarchy. These levels are somewhat like complexity classes, but they define the correlations between the leftmost and rightmost parties. And so in this case, you have um, the local hidden variable models. That's one form of not being able to communicate. And at the other extreme end, you have everything you can do from communication and that's much broader. Now, not so surprisingly, inside the SIG class, I'm gonna define a left SIG class and a right SIG class. Those are the things I can do by only allowing communication in one direction. So I can make an R-sig um, correlator, which receives A on the left and output A on both sides and receives B on the right and does nothing with it. Now this allows the leftmost party to communicate to the rightmost party, but not the other way around. And the left signaling correlator allows the rightmost party to send information to the left, but not the other way around. Now, it's interesting to observe that in, in our physical world, as far as we can tell, classical information is such that if, if I can signal to you, it doesn't help you signal to me. If I can send information to you, it doesn't mean at all that we have, I, if, if you allow me to talk as much as I want, it will never help you 
talk to me. And therefore, um, the left and right signaling classes, they, they're inside of SIG because SIG allows to signal in both directions. The left and right signaling uh, allows only signaling in one direction. And at the middle of these two, at the intersection of these two, we're going to define something that is called no signaling. And no signaling is everything, every correlation that's not powerful enough to, to communicate. Now, I claim that this is more general than the local hidden variable models. And the reason why we believe that is because in particular, the quantum stuff is gonna be in between here. And even that does not allow to communicate. But the no signaling is, doesn't allow to communicate in general. All right, let me... Um, Let me move forward because I don't want to spend too much time on this part. Um, I just want to say the following. Um, what's important is that when you say that they cannot communicate, you are saying that they could use anything that's within no signaling. And no signaling is more powerful than local hidden variable and even more powerful than quantum. So this QNL is quantum non-locality and come up is for commuting operators, which is a generalization of the quantum thing. Um, we know that quantum non-locality is more generous than local hidden variable models. We know that commuting operators are more generous than quantum non-locality. And all these are no signaling models. And we even know some no signaling primitive um, that I could tell you about in some other talk. We even know some general primitive called the PR box for popescu Rorlik. They gave a complete um, characterization, a particular box, such that if you use this box, you can do everything that's not signaling. Now, as cryptographers, we're always very paranoid. If, if you tell me that the assumption is that you cannot signal faster than the speed of light, then I'll give my adversary the power of no signaling. But unfortunately, we do not know of any zero knowledge proofs against no signaling provers. And that's one of the open questions of this research. Because in general, if you allow the provers to be of the no signaling type, we don't know of any zero knowledge proofs against provers of that type. The best we know so far is against quantum provers. So just a quick clarification. Uh, I, I yeah. want um, the relationship between left and right signaling and no signaling. Like, why would why would uh, yeah why would that be why would that have an intersection? I guess since you have some signaling, why would you be in no signaling? Yes. Um, basically, the meaning of the intersection is. No signaling is everything you can do either from right signaling or from left signaling. And it turns out that the only way that you can do something either from right signaling or left signaling is if you don't signal at all. Okay. That's basically the meaning of this intersection. If, if you can do it either by right or left signaling, then you must not signal at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's the meaning of the intersection. And precisely that's because in our physical world, if you right signal, it doesn't help you left signal. And if you left signal, it doesn't help you right signal. So if you need 
if you need somehow to, to write signal, the left signaling cannot do it. And if you need to somewhat left signal, the right signaling cannot do it. There's almost some so, life lessons in there. <laughs> life <book. laughs> yeah, there's a lot of life lessons in physics. Okay, no, that helps a lot. Thank you. All right, so let me um, let me now move on and um, bring you to the protocol. Okay, um, I know it's I'm I'm past my time already, but um, this is going to take um, another half hour. No problem for us. I mean, I don't okay. know about you, Perry, but I'm more than no. Happy. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, all right, so if we take literally the protocol designed by Goldreich, Michali, and Vigderson, and define it in the model of Benor, Goldwasser, Killian, Vigderson, um, meaning that we take the three colorability protocol that I showed you, and we implement the commitments in a model where you have two separate provers, and I'll show how to do that uh, in a little while. Um, if you have that, then um, you would produce a very large graph and you would have to color, provide a commitment for every color of every, every region of the map. And then the verifier can request to see two birds next to each other and see their color. Now, will that yield to a practical pr protocol? And the answer is, um, well, fortunately, because it gave us some interesting work, um, but the answer is no. Because the number of, the number of um, nodes here grows quadratically, and the commitments themselves are pretty big. So if, if you implement this in a relativistic setting, it means that as the, as the maps are gonna get bigger, you're gonna to have to increase the distance between the provers in, in, in an acceptable way. Now, in 2007, Chaillou and Leverrier introduced an alternate protocol that they were able to demonstrate not only was sound against classical provers, but even entangled provers. So this was a major step from the previous work. They were able to show that um, not only can they resist, um, the protocol was zero knowledge. It was using um, a different NP-complete problem, the problem of um, Hamiltonian graphs. So basically what they showed is that even if provers were entangled, they could still not break soundness of the protocol. Now, however, they also still faced the problem of practicality because the, um, the number of the distance between the provers in their case would have to be increasing um, as the cube of the number of nodes. Let me, let me go straight um, to that. In their protocol, the amount of stuff you have to commit before you can get the question grows like the cube of the number of elements in the graph, the number of nodes in the graph cubed is the amount of time you have to invest between the beginning of the commitment and the time where you can get the question. Now, on the contrary, in the protocol I'm gonna describe you, the, 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 the similar calculation leads that we can do things that are logarithmic in the number of uh, vertices. So if, if you grow by a factor of 10, the number of nodes that they involve, 
you must grow the distance between the provers by a, a thousand times more. Whereas in our protocol, if you, sorry. Um, in our protocol, if you increase by a factor of 10, you're gonna increase by an additive factor of two or three, the distance. Of course, with units, but it means basically that in, in our protocol, you can keep the provers very close to each other. Whereas in every existing protocol, as soon as you start growing the instances that you're dealing with, you have to push the provers further and further apart at a very highly increasing distance. So that's really what we were able to accomplish is to have a protocol which is extremely efficient in terms of what the provers and the verifier will say to each other. They will save very little, but they will say that many times. So the way we did that is we started from the, the protocol of uh, Goldreich, Michele, and Vigderson, and we were able to reduce the number of commitments from one commitment per region to a maximum of four commitments altogether. And let me explain to you how we're able to do that. So in our approach, instead of getting one prover to commit and then get that prover to unveil, we're gonna ask literally one prover at the colors of two, two neighboring regions. Now, unfortunately, um, if the prover just gave back the colors, that would be a problem because if he just gave back the colors, then the other prover can do the same and ask two neighbors and learn two other colors elsewhere in the graph. And jointly, they would be able to learn the colors of four, um, four regions. And unfortunately, if you learn four regions, it's not possible to make it zero knowledge. You, you, you completely lose the zero knowledge property if you, if you learn more than two colors. If you learn four colors, you will, you see the issue is whenever you learn that two nodes are of the same color, you're in trouble for zero knowledge. Because if two nodes have the same color, this tells you that they belong to the same coloring class. It doesn't matter if it's red, blue, or yellow, but they're from the same coloring class. They're from the same color. And if you learn that two are of the same color, this is information you cannot take away. Each time you learn that, you're getting more information about the tree coloring. And if you do that repeatedly, ultimately you'll have three bunches corresponding to the tree colors, and then you will have a complete tree coloring. So you can't ask one for the coloring and get it, okay? So instead, we're gonna get him to commit to these two colors back. So if you, if you request to this guy, I want, I want to learn the colors of regions two and three, he's gonna commit back to those colors. And the same can happen at the other end. At the other end, the other verifier can request region zero and two that are these two, and he will learn back commitments of these two regions. Now you may notice that I made some black commitments and some white commitments. That's a trick of our construction. In our construction, there are two types of commitments. They correspond to a binary value. When I request the two, three, the colors of two, three, you commit according to the color that I gave you. So I ask the question in black, you answer in white. Here you ask the question in white, I give you the answer is in black. Now, the trick is the way we construct these commitments, they have a very special property. 
that if you get the same, if you get the commitment of the same region by both provers, one in black and one in, in white, then you can tell what the color is. So individually, you don't learn the color from one of them or from the other one, but you learn the color if you ask them both the same node, the same region number. And if you ask one for the white version and the other, the black version, if you learn both of these, you learn the color. If you don't get both like C0 and C3 here, if you only get one of these commitments, it's completely useless. You don't learn the color. So you don't learn the color at all um, if you only query a single time the, a, a certain region. And only if you query the same region twice can you learn the color. Now this makes an incredibly simple protocol. So how are the commitments actually made? The commitments are super simple if the colors are a number mod three. So the colors are zero, one, and two, zero being red, one being yellow, and two being blue. Um, we're gonna make the commitments by getting the provers to pre-agree on a random trit. A trit is a ternary bit. Um, so one, they agree on a random color and another color such that the sum of the two is ultimately the color that we're after. So on the rightmost column are the colors that I wish, that the provers wish to assign to the regions. This column is a sequence of random colors. And this middle column is simply the difference between the actual color and um, the leftmost column, mod three. Okay, so in each position, columns here, mod three. So this is exactly like a one time pad. If you guys, remember from my class, um, this is a one-time pad mod three instead of a one-time pad mod two, which is more usual. But this is a one-time pad mod three. And so basically what it means is that if you learn only one of those two values, it tells you nothing about the color. And in order to learn the color, you must learn them both. If you learn them both, then you learn the color. But if you learn zero of them or one of them, you don't learn the color at all. It completely hides the color. So this is how, how we commit. So the bit here, zero or one, corresponds to the two ways of requesting a commitment. You either request a commitment with zero or a commitment with one, and then you take the provers take the answer from this table um, and from each entry of that table. Now, the classical, the typical way a commitment is implemented, it would be that you can, you can ask one prover to commit by giving you either the value L0 or L1. So the verifier tells a bit B to the prover and the prover commits to the color C0 in this case by disclosing L0, 0 or L10, depending on the value of the bit. So you give back the one indexed by the bit B, back to this prover. Now this is committing this prover to the content of the box. At a later time, the other prover can ask to this guy to unveil. He can tell him, okay, I want to unveil C0. 
And then that prover will give both L0 and L1 such that the sum is the content. And then the verifiers, they can check that the value given for L0 or L1, the one that was sampled here, is identical. So if this verifier got L0, you will check that when this prover answered L0, L1, that the L0 that he gave is the same one that he got from that prover in the first place. So notice that on the side, he doesn't learn enough to actually figure out what the color is, but at the unveiling, he will learn what the color is. Now, probably the twist which is most important in our work is this idea of unveiling without actually requesting unveiling. So instead of traditionally, you would have a commit step and an unveil step. In our version, there are just commit steps. You don't request to unveil. You get them to unveil without them knowing that you're actually unveiling. That's what we call the unveil via commit principle. You get them both to commit. You get this one to commit, you get that other guy to commit. And if you choose your questions appropriately, then you unveil the color. If you request both of them to commit one in black and one in white. Now, let me now make very clear what our protocol is. Our protocol is extremely simple. Our protocol is choose two regions, I and J, and choose a bit B. Request the prover, I want to learn, I want to learn the colors of I and J, and I want to use, I want you to use bit B to decide which version of the commitment you're going to give me back. Now, the prover P1 gives you back the two L values corresponding to I and J and to your bit. And with prover P2, you can do the same with I prime, J prime, and B prime, and you learn the same information corresponding to I prime, J prime, B prime. Now, now the point is the following. If the verifier asks the two provers, the same node or the same region with the same bit B, then they don't care about the colors. They only check that they give consistent answers. If you ask them the same exact question, you should expect to get the same exact answer. And this will determine that they are acting honestly. If they, if they fail such a test, then they're not acting honestly. Honest provers should always give the same question, the same answer back when you give them the same node and the same B. They should always give you the same answer back. So basically, this is the mathematical statement of it. If, if there's a, a, a node K that is both among I, J, and I, I prime, J prime, and if bit is, B is equal to B prime, then the answer corresponding to this K should be identical. So if, if they're asked the color of a given node with the same B, then they should reply the same answer. We don't really care what the answer is, but it should be consistent. They should give you the right and the same answer back. However, if you ask both provers the same node with distinct B, distant, sorry, distinct Bs, then you learn the color. Because you can from those two Bs infer what the color was as the sum mod three. So let me tell you how we use this. The verifiers will alternate questions between some questions that are meant 
just to check um, consistency. So in this example, they ask for the regions two, three, and for the region zero, two, but with the same color black. Then the only thing the verifiers are gonna, are gonna check is the fact that those two were identical. If you ask both provers the same question with the same B at a common node, then they must be identical. The, the, the answers must be identical. Those answers don't disclose the color, but they are identical. And the other thing they will alternate with is sometimes they're just going to ask them both for the same two regions, but with different color questions, and then they will learn the two colors. Does that make sense? Yeah, but is there, a, just to be sure, is there like a recoloring by the provers? After the Absolutely. Okay. Each time you do this, you're going to recolor. Right, okay. Okay, so the protocol still follows the principle of the Goldreich, Michaeli, Vigderson protocol. They Each time they do this, they recolor, they re-randomize the coloring each time. And they agree so, on this randomness beforehand. They, they have absolutely. To okay. So they complete, and, and that turned out to be an interesting technical problem because we when we implemented this, we did that with FPGAs, very limited hardware in terms of memory. And so we needed the verifiers to have, uh, sorry, we needed the provers to have this randomization already pre-agreed before they started. And they had very small memory. So we had, a, we had a difficulty of how do you get them to memorize all these changes, um, these randomizations in this small memory that we have. And that, that we solved it, but it was a very interesting problem. Now, in terms of soundness, um, the, the honest case is simple to analyze. Because in the honest case, we can think of the two provers having a joint table, which is identical and pre-agreed upon. And this joint table I call LK of IJB, which is the table telling exactly how you should answer when given the question I, J, and B. So you can imagine in, in the honest case, you can imagine that they, they memorize one such table for every round of the protocol. And then they recolor, that's one thing they have to fix. And the randomness of these LI0 and LI1 has to be updated as well. That's why it's, it's difficult to keep track of all this with small memory because you have to randomize not only the coloring, but you have to also randomize these LI0, this sequence that I said you pick randomly. This has to be repicked randomly as well. well. So typically, if you don't make any effort, you, you end up memorizing one such table each for each round. Now, however, in the case where the provers are dishonest, they can completely um, arbitrarily choose what's inside these tables. And they can even decide that they have tables that are not identical. So they can have, if, if you compare the colors on the left and on the right, they don't even have to be identical. So they can each have a table and do their best in fooling the verifier. Sorry. Um, in, 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 in the soundness analysis, we're looking at the situation where the prover is trying to convince the verifier of that W is an L when it's not. And so they can try to optimize this probability 
by agreeing on tables that are not even identical. Um, and they can do that in a completely arbitrary way. Now, the purpose of testing that they give you back the same answer is to make sure that we can extract from these tables a well-defined table of corresponding to LIB and LJB. We say that an LIB is well-defined from these tables if for all J, K, whenever I appears as one value, one node that you're gonna check with a certain B, then it's always the same LIB that you get. This is a little bit complicated, but basically what it's saying, whatever, whatever environment you question about um, region I, you should always give me back the same LIB when I question about I. It doesn't matter if I look at node two with node five or node two with node zero or node two with node one. It doesn't matter who I partner it with. When I ask you about this particular node with a certain B, you should always answer the same way. So the test of consistency is to check that this is well-defined. And if at any point you find that it is not well-defined, then you give up because then you see that the provers are not honest because honest provers will never fail this test. Honest provers would always answer back something that's consistent. However, if you never find any such problem, then LI0 and LI1 end up being well-defined, which means that every node ends up having a well-defined color and the well-defined color must be an invalid tricoloring. Because if W is not in L, if the graph is not tricolorable, there's no way to assign colors. That's actually a valid tricoloring. If you assign three colors, there must be two neighbors that are of the same color. Now, what yeah, this so means, yeah. So just to, you, you always ask the question on the edges, right? I, I, uh, from the paper, if I remember correctly, you always you're always asking the question. That's right. You always across across an edge. Ask about edges. You you pick an edge, or in in the language of the regions, you pick two neighboring regions, and then you ask a question about that region. If you want to find out the color, then you ask the same two regions to both of them. And if you just want to check consistency, then you just make sure that the two pairs you ask have a common node. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, if your if your map has a single pair of color of node of the, of regions neighboring each other of the same color, then you have only probability one over the number of edges, the number of neighboring regions. Um, you just have one over that, one over this number probability of detecting an error. Now, I'm not gonna explain this in detail, but the consistency test is even more subtle in the sense that you can, you can have strategies that will fail, that will always work the coloring test, but will fail the consistency test only once out of five times the number of edges. And so that's part of what we demonstrated in the theoretical paper. In, the, in this case, um, the soundness error, that is the maximum probability of convincing the verifiers when um, the provers are dishonest is gonna be at most one minus one over five times the number of edges. Now, if you remember how the number E is defined, the number E is one plus one over N power N when N goes to infinity. So 
following the same logic, if you repeat this thing, five number of E, size of E, K iterations, then the probability that you never get caught when your soundness error is one minus one over five size of E, if you repeat five size of E, K iterations, you're gonna be at, uh, at an error, soundness error of E to the minus K. Okay, so in order to achieve a certain bound that you like of soundness error e to the minus k, if you want to make this exponentially small, then you have to iterate five number of edges k iterations. Now that's what we're going to. That, that is what we implemented. Now, as for the zero knowledge case, there are only as there are only three things that the verifiers can do. They can either ask two regions twice that are next to each other and learn their two colors. They can ask for only one region in common and learn, learn only one color, or they can ask completely disjoint regions and learn no color at all. That's each in each iteration the only things they can do. Even dishonest verifiers that don't follow our guidelines, they can only learn two neighboring regions color or a single color or no color at all. That's the only thing they can do with our protocol. And therefore, it is zero knowledge. Okay, I'm not giving you more details than this. Let me tell you a little bit about our experimental setup. So we built an experimental setup. Here you see the verifier is in this computer and the provers are in this FPGA smaller equipment here. They're connected by an optical fiber to exchange information as fast as possible. And the verifier, so here's one and the other is here, which, so this is the computer. And this is the, uh, the other FPGA is on this table. They're 60 meters apart. And if you calculate how fast a computer can compute these days, their clock cycle is so fast that these two things are able to speak to each other and run the protocol that I described faster than light can travel on these 60 meters. So the verifier sends the question to the prover, the prover looks up at his table, answers back to the verifier faster than what it takes for light to travel 60 meters between the two. And we believe that in further experiments, we can bring this down to a single meter. That with these, this is pretty, of the shelf equipment. This is not very expensive equipment, but if we do it with fancier equipment, we believe we can bring it down to a single meter. So, so you're limited by the clock cycle of the equipment. That's the limiting factor right now. Well, actually the, the main factor is latency. When okay. the verifier wants to ask the question to the prover, it takes a certain amount of time before the electronics can actually transfer the, the question out to the fiber optics that it's encoded and sent in the fiber. And then the prover receives it. It's decoded so that he get to understand what the question is. Then he looks up super fast. He finds the answer, re-encoded it for the fiber optics. And I mean, it's ridiculous, but the main constraint is the encoding, decoding of the information for communicating it. If this was a bus that they're connected in wires to, to one another, this would be so much faster. I mean, it's, it's, we couldn't find any cheap mechanism to communicate from one to the other that has less latency than this fiber optic system. Okay, so that's why you need that document. Sorry? So that's why you need better equipment, basically. Basically. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, 
so the kind of distance verification constraint that um, we make is that we don't, you see the verifiers, they actually have no idea where the provers are. They don't monitor where the provers are. All that they care about is that they answer fast enough. So I drew these two circles around the two verifiers. The verifiers know where they are because they trust each other and they can physically locate each other and they can exchange information either through GPS or um, they can figure out where each one is and they can talk to each other to make sure that they know very well where their locations are. But each one verifier is responsible for talking to, to its local prover. And so when the verifier spits out the question, IJB, it starts propagating towards the provers like this. Then the provers receive the question, process it, and reply and answer back to its verifier. And what we monitor is that the answer from this prover arrives to the verifier faster than the question from the other verifier. So the question from V2 is propagating here towards V1. And the condition we have to satisfy is that the answer from P1 to V1 arrives earlier than the question from V2 arrives to V1. And the logic is simple. The fastest way to get from V2 to V1 is a direct line. And so if you, if you calculate the time it takes at the speed of light to go with no latency, to go from V2 to V1, you wanna make sure that the answer from P1 gets back to V1 before that happens. Because wherever P1 is located, he cannot take advantage of V2's question or P2's answer any faster than the direct line between V2 and V1. So let me show you another example. Um, so in this context, the answers get back on time, are back in time, and so the verifiers accept and go on. Now we can move the provers further away from the verifiers and then have the questions go out of the verifiers like this and like that, reach their provers who answer back. So so P2 gets his question first because he's closer to V2 than P1 to V1 and answers back. And P1 gets the question later and so he answers later. But still in the race between the answer from P1, so on the P2 V2 side, everything is fine. The answer from P2 comes in much earlier than the question from V1. So P2 is on time. And in the race between the answer from P1 and the question from V2, P1 is going to slightly win and they can still function within these boundaries. But if you go out of the boundary like this, then what's going to happen is that the question from V2 is going to win in the race against the answer from P1. And when that happens, we get an answer which is too late and you um, reject when such an incident happens. And that's the protocol ends as soon as this happens because the provers made something that got them not to satisfy the relativistic constraints anymore. Now, in reality, we have to keep some space between these two circles because we, have to take into account the processing time of the prover, which was not taken into account on the previous figure. Now we did two experiments, one at long distance, 390 meters apart, 
and we used a GPS for the two verifiers to sync, yeah, for the two verifiers to keep synchronized with each other. Um, we used the GPS so that they were triggering the questions at essentially the same time. And so they could, um, they knew exactly when they should expect the answers from their provers. And we had a one meter link. We tolerated a distance like a meter between the prover and the verifier at each end. And we did a short distance experiment at 60 meters. And still there was a one meter separation between the provers and verifiers. And then there was an optical link between the two verifiers and they used that optical link to keep synchronized. They knew the back and forth time between them so the one verifier signaled a clock, which took a certain amount of time to reach the other one. And when the clock reached the other one, then both would ask, would ask the question. And so they kept synchronized using this optical link. So this, this is view from the top, what the um, experimental setup looked like. And this is a summary of the protocol here. Now the graph, the, the graph that we use at 588 nodes or regions and the number of connections between them was 1,097. And we used a value of K, which is 100, so that the soundness error was something close to 2 to the minus 128. And we generated a graph using another technique that I'm not going to describe today, but such that all known three colorable algorithms were very slow at figuring out the tree coloring of it. Now, let me just say a few more words about the entangled provers. We proved in a different paper that you mentioned um, that we can also apply this to um, a scenario with entangled provers. It's based on a very powerful theorem by Kemp, Kobayashi, Matsumoto, Toner, and Vidic, which says that if you have a multi-prover interactive proof sound in the local case, as our protocol with two provers, then you can augment this protocol with a third prover that's going to act exactly what, like one of the first two provers. And then this new protocol with three provers is sound against entangled provers. Now that's related to the so-called monogamy of entanglement. Um, if the provers use entanglement to cheat soundness, the fact that there's a third one that has to do exactly the same thing limits highly how you can use entanglement because you cannot at the same time be entangled with one guy and with the other guy in exactly the same way. That's the notion of monogamy of entanglement. If you make a very strong entanglement between the first two, you can't be entangled with the third one at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very powerful general theorem that they use in a completely different context. Um, and basically it tells us that if we make a protocol identical to ours, but with a third prover, which is mimicking P1 or P2 at random, so the, the verifier, the verifiers will request the third prover, tell me exactly if I, if I ask those questions to P1, what did he say? Or if I ask those questions to P2, what did he say? And P3 is just supposed to say exactly the same thing as the other guy. Then suddenly soundness is quantum, is against quantum as well. Now for the case analysis, it gets a bit more complicated because now you have three verifiers and three verifiers with three edges can see still a limited number of possibilities. One case in which they see all three colors, but that's also fine. You don't learn anything except for the three random colors. You never learn two of the same color. Or you see two, the coloring of two birds, or you see the coloring of one. 
or zero. So this is what dishonest verifiers can obtain from the provers, um, which basically says that it remains zero knowledge even against three provers. If you went to four, it would no longer be zero knowledge. Now the trouble in this case is that the powerful theorem changes significantly the error, the soundness error. If you remember the soundness error in the case of local provers was one minus one over five times the number of edges. Now in the entangled case, it's one minus one over the fourth power of 16 times the number of edges. So this soundness error is much closer to one than the classical case, the local case, which means that you have to iterate something like 16 number of edges to the fourth power k iterations to reach the same level of security. Now, unfortunately, doing that would take a very long time. Just to give you an idea, the protocol that we implemented with two provers was running in one second. To run the same thing with three provers, parallelizing using the most efficient signaling apparatus that we have on Earth today. So that's a paper from last summer. Um, apparently in Japan, they set up a new world standard, um, gold standard at 319 terabits per second. So even if you can communicate using this fastest piece of equipment possible and repeat very, very fast using this equipment, it would take roughly K hours at this rate. But it would take weeks, if not months, using our equipment to run the protocol once. So that's unfortunately a little bit too slow. So we did not implement the entangled case because it's just too slow. So let me conclude with just a few open questions. Um, in the entangled case, we're looking for theoretical solutions first. We're looking for better bounds on the error rate because the bounds we use this fourth power is probably just an artifact of the proof that's proving the theorem. It's, it's not inherently necessarily the fourth power. Maybe the protocol just as we have it for local works. We just don't know. OK, so we're looking for better bounds um, to make the entangled case um, with fewer iterations. And also, the protocol that we describe is a proof of membership. It's proving that the graph is tricolorable. But it's not proving that the prover knows a tricoloring. That's a subtle question that we still have to resolve. We have resolved it in the local case, but not in the entangled case. And as for the no signaling provers, we would like a general theorem similar to the one that uh, I told you about, such that if we have a solution, a, a, a MIP, which is sound against local or entangled provers, that we can augment it with more provers and obtain no signaling. We don't know that, but it would be wonderful if we could do that. I would like to see some zero knowledge against no signaling provers. As I told you, we've, no such thing is known right now. Um, or finally, we would like to be able to say, Einstein didn't go quite far enough when he said that no information can go faster than the speed of light. He actually meant that no correlation can propagate faster than what quantum mechanics can do. This is the no signaling area that I showed you. We could potentially include it as part of special relativity. We could say not only signaling faster than the speed of light is impossible, but correlating in a no signaling way more than quantum cannot be done faster than the speed of light. And I mean, 
there's no experiment right now that can that we don't know of any experiment that can tell these things apart. We don't know if the orange part that I showed in, in my hierarchy, if that's possible physically, or if it's just impossible physically and that the principle of special relativity goes beyond um, what we thought um, before. That's about what I wanted to tell you. I learned well, a you. great amount. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry I took two hours, but that's no, what no, I sorry. did. No, 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 it's, don't feel sorry, but um, I managed to squeeze all this in an hour yeah. when I spoke with uh, at the, in the physics department. And I'm going to present this lecture again on Thursday this week at the, the Department of uh, Computer Science at University of Montreal this week. And again, I have to squeeze that, to squeeze that in an hour. Yeah. I, I, I managed to do it in about an hour and a quarter when I speak continuously and I don't mm -hmm. get questions in the between yeah. and so on. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I oh, did yeah, my very much. Do you have a minute for uh, one or two questions? Absolutely. Uh, I was just curious, um, in practice, how does the two prover system work? Like if we try to go back to the ATM example, uh, is there a, a feasible way where it okay. can Okay, yeah, so let me, let, let me clarify about that. Um, the identity of, of a person is going to be a public information, which is a graph. And the person knows the tree coloring of this graph. And this is what is special about this person. The graph was generated by me or me and my bank. We, we agreed that this graph, this public graph is going to be whoever wants to identify me. I'm going to prove that I know the tree coloring of this graph to whoever wants to make sure that I'm me. And by making sure that I don't give this tree coloring to anybody, um, I remain the only person in the world who can, who can do the tree coloring of the graph. And the reason why I can tree color the graph in the first place is because I created the graph and the tree coloring together. When I constructed the graph, I used some randomization to construct it. But each time I added new components to a graph, I made sure that I was able to color whatever I added. And that's the generation of the graph part that I did not describe. It gives me um, a mechanism to generate some pretty large random looking graphs that are believably hard to tree color, but with the tree coloring, such that the tree coloring was created at the time of creation of the graph. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Oh, sorry. In, 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 um, in the multi-prover case, does this look different when someone's actually using this protocol, like, um, or, or as one individual? Well, okay, it means that problem. in practice, we would need to keep a separation between the two provers. So you can imagine when we manage to bring it down to a single meter, then you can imagine that you would have two bank cards um, that you would trigger the bank cards using your fingerprint or something like that. You wouldn't have to memorize the tree coloring. Your cards would know the tree coloring. Um, and then you put in the two cards a meter apart in, in this enlarged teller machine. You put the two cards in two slots and you, the, 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 the teller machine will act as the, verif as the verifier at both okay. ends. And um, it's up to the machine now to keep them separate, right? If, if the machine allows them to get closer, then it may lose soundness and it may allow people to pretend to be me. Um, but if it keeps them separated, it will make sure that soundness is guaranteed. Okay, so it's not so, it's not so difficult to imagine that kind of thing being implemented. Yes, I'm not saying it's gonna be implemented in the next five or 10 years, but um, I mean, the implementation of such thing may take a long time after you demonstrate it in the lab, because it's only the financial implications that will get 
the system to change. If, I mean, the, the current system continue to live on to live on because it's not costing enough money, it would be much more expensive to change the system than keep it as it is and deal with the frauds. Um, so until the fraud level gets, until it gets higher, we're not going to see a change in the system considerably. But eventually, um, the technology is ready whenever a system wants to evolve to our method. Cool. Any thoughts you have yes. on this one? Well, Zero knowledge is involved in the blockchain in many in many cases and many situations. Um, we're we're saying that zero knowledge is relevant to blockchain now. Exactly how that would how our technique can be combined with the blockchain is a different question in itself. I mean, we, we prefer to work with the ATM example because it's very easy for everyone to visualize how we can use this in practice. Now, I can't even tell you exactly how we would use it in, in the blockchain. We use blockchain as um, a buzzword that people know and that links zero knowledge with this environment. Now, whether um, we would use our technique for any particular blockchain application, I don't know. Um, it's probably worth um, getting an undergrad project of students trying to figure out if you can use, if you can really use our way of doing zero knowledge proof with the blockchain. Well, fair, fair enough. Uh, Carlos? No, I think I, I was going to, I was going to close up. But Perry, you got any questions? Okay, oh, well, that's good. I think Perry, that's all for me. Sorry. All right. No worries. <laughs> okay. This uh, latency can't imagine doing a, a multi-prover proofs over the Zoom. Um, okay. So, <laughs> uh, thank you so much again, Professor Kripo. We had a, a really great time, and hopefully, we can have more conversations like this in the future. And best of luck with uh, with. All right. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Good luck Thursday. All right. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.